Thank you. I'm so sorry not to be able to be with you today. I was really looking forward to it, um, but there are his family issues, and I, I absolutely cannot. Sorry. So I, I want to talk about um, ethics and publishing from the point of view of making the place better, or the place is our place. So um, Pete Seeger semi-famously would, uh, at, um, at music uh, festivals, would be found picking up trash that he came across on the ground. And um, without any fanfare, just, you know, so you pick it up. And I had the same experience a few months ago when I was walking down the street in Boston, and there was an elderly man in a, in a pretty nice suit who was picking a plastic bag out of uh, one of the shrubbery along the side of a road. And I thanked him and looked at him, and it was, it was Governor Dukakis. He once ran for president. You know, just this is how they are making the place better, right? I mean, we talk. I mean, that's why he's doing it. He doesn't want any recognition. He's just doing a little thing consistently to make the place better. Um, what I want to talk about today, I mean, I'm totally in favor. This is civic responsibility, and of course, it's a wonderful thing, and we need to keep doing it. Nothing's going to change that. But there's another possibility as well in changing um, not just uh, picking up the trash and doing other you know, more significant things, perhaps, but changing actually how the place works. This is because the place has changed. It's a different sort of place now. So um, that's what we want to look at. Uh, and I'm going to try to situate it uh, within a context of traditional Western ethics, morality. And I'm going to, uh, lightning fast, don't worry. And, and uh, I'm going to act as if I really understand this. I'm really just sort of plumbing my own shallows. But So uh, traditionally, um, one type of moral stance uh, one type of moral philosophy has been um, uh, deontological or doing things because of principles. Um, that's a pretty uh, traditional approach. Um, over And it lasted for a long time, and over time um, some moved away from that because there are times when principles make the world worse. You follow principles and for whatever reason. Um, and so, for example, in the case of open access, a principled approach would say um, everybody has an equal right to know. That's just a principle, and we need to support it. And I like that. But um, The alternative has been a type of uh, what's called consequentialism, which looks at the consequences of, of actions. It says that's actually more important than principles. Uh, we want good outcomes. Um, so the sort of uh, consequentialist approach to open access would say, might say that um, we get good results. If everybody can get at all this information, uh, we people invent things, they discover things that otherwise wouldn't have been discovered. And that's another good reason to support open access. Um, one particular type of consequentialism has become uh, pretty much dominant in, in Western thinking ever since it was introduced in the early, uh, early, very early 1800s. Uh, Jeremy Bentham generally gets the credit for this. Utilitarianism, we're all roughly familiar with it. Um, the idea is that rather you look at consequences, but you look at overall aggregated consequences, and your aim is to do that which will promote the maximal happiness um, and or the minimum of pain and suffering. Um, the principles, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the deontological approach um, mirrors uh, early um, government, <laughs> the idea that we are governed by uh, kings, monarchs, uh, gods who issue principles that we mere mortals follow. Um, consequentialism uh, sort of, uh, this is way too approximate, but sort of follows the rise of science and, and uh, the Enlightenment where um, we can actually see the effects of things. We start paying attention not to just the principles and the laws, but we, we start from the effects. We see how, what causes what and how they interact. So um, the point is that there is a connection between um, our moral stances and, and thinking and what, the rest of what's going on in our lives and our worlds. And so it's not a coincidence by any means that utilitarianism arose um, when uh, in England at a time when the class system was was horrible, was, was had horrible results. So London was a hellhole if you didn't have money in class. Uh, we were literally, they were literally shoving small children into openings the size of small children so that they could scrub the soot out of it and they somehow uh, 
rationalize this as, as good and proper because it was better than the little poor children going out and being pickpockets and ending up being drunkards and being hung because they had rationalized the class system as, uh, as based upon moral deserts. Um, and around that very same time, um, statistics started to become a thing. They got brought over to uh, England from Germany, the idea of statistics, at the end of the 18th century. Um, and this gave us a tool by which we could actually use facts, so look at the effects of some of these policies and try to maximize the overall happiness. But within a statistical system, everybody is equal, which is morally a really important and good thing. All of their interests are equal, which is the crucial change that utilitarianism, utilitarianism makes. All, everybody's interests are equal, so you, you maximize so that the most people's interests are met. Statistics does a good job on this because statistics, you are a number. And we may resist this, um, and we did in the computer age resist this. Um, I am not a number and that sort of thing, but it actually has this incredible, incredibly good moral result. So in the computer age, another big change, we get a new infrastructure and we get some new moral techniques. And there's a lot to be said here. I just want to point to one, which is game theory, in which we uh, moral issues start to look like games that have rules and you can try out different, make different moves and see what the solutions are. So it's a type of consequentialism that assumes that there's a relatively complex interaction among, among games. This, in, during the Cold War, we get... Uh, um, Wargaming, in which we, in a cold-blooded way, calculate how many millions of deaths um, this or that type of nuclear attack would would produce. Um, and it, it, these days, this is still very prevalent. Um, this sort of thinking, a lot of moral problems now, of these conundrums that are put put forward, are basically game-like scenarios. You have somebody on a track, and you have a couple alternatives. You can play with the rules and so forth. Um, so. Uh, this is not a coincidence because computers are ultimately completely rule-based rule -based environments, right? I mean, it's, uh, they are nothing but um, that's what they do. We call them algorithms or programs or whatever you want to call them, but they are like games in that they are uh, a constrained and somewhat artificial set of rules. When they match, uh, when we're trying to capture reality, we call them models. We call them models other times, too. But... Um, but Computers are rules, rule based, and morality begins, in some instances anyway, to look like a, a type of game. Um, game theory starts to apply. Um, okay, now we have yet another new environment, radically different than the computer based one, uh, which is the internet. And so we can expect, yet again, new type of morality. And I think we are seeing that. But to see it, I want to go back to two pre internet um, changes, um, two new ideas. Um, one is the ethics of care. This uh, primarily springs out of the work of Carol Gilligan in the 1970s. Um, and the, I'm going to do a terrible job of explaining this. It's a really important um, theory, um, idea. And roughly the idea is we are set, um, rather than thinking of us as sort of cold-blooded or rational animals and so forth, we are in fact caregivers, and we are not primarily individuals. We are caregivers and caretakers. We care about one another to one degree or another. It, it, maybe we have a deficiency in that, but that's how we, we are fundamentally, we are um, people who care about one another take, and take care of one another and do so in an environment that is built around this. It's not just a set of rule-based mechanisms. It's a set of relationships that are characterized by care in all of its forms, including the lack of care. Um, and which also means that you have to look at individual cases um, to see what is, is best for those who need care and those who are giving care. Um, and so we no longer are these sort of individual um, ciphers whose overall interests are being maximized. And the second goes back actually further, to, it goes back all the way to Aristotle, um, then sort of gets forgetten, forgotten during the uh, Enlightenment, and then um, Elizabeth Anscombe is, uh, is given credit uh, properly in 1958 for resuscitating this, which is a morality of virtue that focuses on virtue, which looks at um, morality through the lens of individual character. Um, moral character, um, and includes the idea, importantly, that um, happiness counts. That is, that, um, and not just sort of uh, 
things that feel good, but the, the deep happiness that comes, according to this idea, from human flourishing. But humans flourish differently. And so rather than having a single idea of happiness, um, we get a, a morality of flourishing ultimately out of this line of thought, where flourishing is, depends upon the person, depends upon you. You flourish differently than I do. Um, and that's, that's right. That's how it, it does work. So it seems, these are all pre-internet, but it's both of these ideas, but it seems to me that they um, uh, anticipate important properties of the internet. The internet takes these up and these are becoming, I think, more important, even more important ideas. So the, the flourishing, I'm uh, sorry, the ethics of care says, well, we're connected. Watch the internet, it's a set of connections. And the, um, the idea of flourishing, the virtue, ethics says we are individuals who flourish differently. Um, and that's those two ideas, the connection of individuals who are different in their interests and needs and how they're going to flourish, but are still connected and connected ultimately through care. That is what the internet is. That's the fundamental architecture of the internet um, at, its, at its best. This is, it is, a, and the thing that's most remarkable about it, because rather than it simply being an open public space in which we can broadcast uh, messages equally to everyone, um, the internet is, uh, is a sort of Hegelian dialectical uh, uh, movement beyond mass communication, where we have mass individual connection and communication. We get to express ourselves, for better and for worse, as who we are, what we are, what matters to us, how we flourish, and to do so in connection. This, I think, ultimately reflects the fundamental nature of morality, which is also um, apparent in the architecture of the Internet. So, for, in order to be a moral creature, you have to be cognizant of at least three things. The first is that the world matters to us. What happens to us matters to us. The world presents itself to us as something that, that is important, that we care about, that we care about. There is that term again, that matters to us. So the world matters to us. It matters to us equally. It's sort of the utilitarianism idea, right? The, the, the world matters equally to the boy being shoved up the chimney as it does to the aristocrat sitting in his you know, lounge, uh, drinking the, the sherry and the rest of that. Um, it matters equal, it, equally to us and it matters to us differently, which is the flourishing idea. And if you lack any of the, those three ideas, and they're not even ideas, they're ways of being in the world, if, if you lack any of these three, then you are a moral monster, you are amoral, you're a sociopath, you're a narcissist, you're not getting it. You're not a moral person. And there, everybody in this room accepts these three, one way or another. We live this way, as if the world matters to us. It matters to us all equally, and it matters to each of us differently. This is exactly the world that the Internet presents to us, a world in which everybody gets to express what matters to them in a linked environment. Now, having said that, it's really important to recognize, as everybody in this room does, that the internet does not live up to the ideal of the best sort of caring and nurturing and, and flourishing. That there are entire categories of people for whom the internet is an absolute freaking nightmare. It is a hostile, horrible place. And I, I don't want to uh, pass that over. I don't want to minimize it. And one of the ways of minimizing, and I think it's, it's somewhat true, is to say, well, you know, language also has these characteristics. It's a way of connecting us um, and letting us see how the world matters to other people. And so language is fundamentally moral. And yet, on the other hand, people use language in the most despicable, horrible, oppressive, cruel ways. And that's true of language. It's also true of the internet. But that lets the internet off the hook too much because I think we are learning that there are things about the internet that, that encourage, not only enable, but encourage the worst of human behavior. I, I, that's beyond what I can talk about here. It's actually, I also don't have, I don't have an answer. So I, but it's really important to, to um, keep that in mind all, uh, throughout this talk and throughout all of our interactions on the net, of course. So the internet is, I believe, offering us something fundamentally new really, really new in the world, in a way, a way that um, 
re-expresses what's important in, and, and at the basis of morality, but does so in, in a new way. It's a new set of affordances. It's a new infrastructure. So let's, you know, for example, the old idea of publishing, old and, and current and, you know, as well, is that an author writes something, it gets published, and then readers read it. And uh, we tend to, not necessarily in this room, but we have tend to, thought, to think of publishing as a way in which information is transferred. Um, and we thought about it as something that uh, almost always has been done in private by an author, um, perhaps with the help of an editor, and then it goes through the publishing process, be published, make public, and enters into the public realm and then um, is read. So it's a private process until it is published. And on the internet, you know, that still happens, of course. It always will happen to some extent. Um, but it's not the only thing that happens. So first of all, it gets published, but it doesn't get published into an open public. It gets published into a social space. And in the, in the battle between the public and the private, um, I think the third term that gets left out way too often is, well, it's not exactly a public thing, it's a social thing. It's a thing in which a public is a big open space of individuals. A social space is a big public space, open space, in which individuals are connected and want more connection. And the connections are all individual, and I think the ethics of care helps to uh, help us understand the nature of those connections as well as their occasional, and perhaps frequent, failures. So it's a social space. It's not just some open information space. No, this is a space that we've built link by link, site by site, app by app, because we care about something. We care about what's going on there, and what's going on in our world, and what's happening to us, and what's happening to the other people we care about. The second thing is that, uh, as I think we've known now for a long time, this work in, in private Public, public, uh, sorry, publish when done, that still works frequently, but less and less so. That much of the most interesting work is being done, the work's being done in public, in the social arena. And even when it's published only once it's done, the author and the publisher say, yep, yeah, it's done, out it goes. It's only then that it's taken up socially and uh, appropriated by the culture. It's then when it has its effect, and that effect is being... Uh, uh, mediated through social interactions, whether or not the author and publisher like it. And that sort of cultural appropriation is absolutely essential, and, and we need it. Now we can, we can see it and has more of an effect. How we appropriate is having more of an effect on that act of appropriation. Um, and furthermore, this is not simply, therefore, the transfer of information. This is making stuff. This is having all sorts of effects um, and doing things in the world. Um, everything we can possibly think of with this. So it's no longer simply the transfer of information and making some individuals better individuals and who then go out and make a better world. This is going out into a social space where people have tools by which they can take this content and put it to use in, in all sorts of ways. So this is a type of... I, I, this, I, I, what this leads to, I think, is a type of consequentialism. But consequentialism has assumed um, uh, properly so, that yeah, acts have consequences. Of course, that's behind consequentialism, but consequentialism has assumed that these, these consequences are knowable and predictable, and without that, then the, the traditional morality of consequentialism just falls apart, because you can't, you're trying to be moral based on the consequences, but if you can't know the consequences, you can't know the morality. So, we are, it assumes that these consequences are knowable and predictable, and this is a good thing. And I want to pretty much argue against that and say that the Internet is arguing against that. The Internet is giving us a new idea. So if you go back 50,000, 70,000, some say 500,000 or a million years ago, you'll find human beings who were uh, crafting um, arrows and knives, arrowheads after knives. We have arrowheads that are 70,000 years old, um, which means that... Um, humans were sitting around with a set of intentions in mind. Right, that, that this is, um, they, they wanted to, uh, you know, sorry, it's a caveman, just for the moment, we'll assume, um, who thinks, okay, uh, I think that tomorrow might be a good day for a, the hunt. I think there may be some birds flying ahead, so I better craft some arrows. And so he crafts a set of arrows, which is great. The only issue is that, you know, the next day comes and maybe only one bird flies by. There goes the bird. And in which case, 
he crafted too many arrows, and that was a waste of, uh, you know, that he, 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 he over-prepared, which is a waste of resources. Or maybe it's just a gigantic flock of birds, and he goes overhead, and he only crafted four or five arrows, which means he underprepared, which is a lost opportunity. Or what's maybe even worse, suppose no birds come by, instead a giant woolly mammoth comes and kills him because he crafted arrows instead of the spears, and so then he misprepared. So our most basic strategy has been, for tens of thousands of years, the strategy of strategies for addressing the future has been to anticipate and to prepare. This works really well, of course, we're always going to do it, but we can now see the price that we pay for it. We, we couldn't see the price before because it was the only thing we could do. But the price of over-preparing, over under-preparing, and mispreparing is a very serious, serious price. We can see that now because we have other ways of doing things. So one of those other ways is to build open platforms. And by an open platform, I mean an organization that takes its resources, its data maybe, and uh, some set of its data and some set of services and makes them openly available to developers anywhere on the web, anywhere in the world, who can without permission build stuff using those resources. Facebook gave this a huge boost in 2007, I think, when it opened up its own resources. It opened up an API, an application programming inter interface that allows developers to do what I just said. And so within seven months, 400,000 people had signed up to, uh, to use these resources without permission. Um, or you didn't need permission for what you're going to do with them, and they had built over 30,000 apps, and now the number of apps is just enormous. Um, it's not just Facebook doing this, a lot of educational institutions, MIT is doing this, Harvard Library has, uh, sorry, New York Times um, uh, and other media outlets make a bunch of their resources available to any developer who wants to use it or build an app with them. Um, here's Harvard Library has an open platform for its metadata. Um, GitHub is an amazing resource for doing this for um, uh, reusing resources. The Digital Public Library of America, you're going to hear from Dan Cohn later today, um, has an API it's, it, um, that gives open access to all of its resources, uh, virtually all of its resources, because it, it is an open access uh, site, which is really quite amazing. And developers build really interesting apps using this stuff. Even Marvel Comics, famously litigious, they will sue the pants off of you for the slightest infraction if you use their in, uh, intellectual property, a term I detest and is dangerously wrong, and uh, um, I wish I were there today because whenever anybody uses that term, my hand is going to go up and, and be obnoxious. Terrible, terrible, dangerous term. Anyway, um, even they now have an open platform where... Developers can get access to information about 8,000, there are 8,000 different characters. So this is, this is a pretty widespread thing, um, becoming more so, lots of places, lots of failures, but many successes, of these, uh, successes of, the, of these. But it shouldn't surprise us too much because this sort of open platform approach um, is merely replicating the Internet's own architecture. The Internet um, was designed to support apps and information and processes that the designers of the internet did not anticipate, which is exactly what open platforms do. They make information and resources available to developers that the owners of those resources, uh, for uses that the owners of those resources simply could not anticipate, because nobody can anticipate what people are going to do, what people are going to be interested in, what's going to help them flourish, what's going to help them care for others. We simply cannot do it. Um, oh, damn, I'm almost out of time. Um, we see this not only on the Internet, we also see it at unconferences, where rather than having the organizers uh, try to anticipate what it will be interesting to the attendees, the attendees do. They get there and they build their own agenda. We see this in the minimal viable product approach by which companies release and sell products that have a minimal feature set so that they can learn by watching what their customers do um, what customers actually want, rather than trying to anticipate a complete feature set. We see this in A-B testing where we don't know, we can't anticipate which of two versions of an ad are going to work better. So we put up both, um, we let people click, we see what people do. Um, New York Times is doing this now for headlines. 
<laughs> it's a refusal to anticipate. We see this in the most basic strategy of um, on one of the most basic strategies from the beginning of the web, which is rather than um, curating and deciding this is what's going to be of interest and importance to our users, let's just put everything up that we can. For one thing, we, curation doesn't scale. At the web size, uh, we've got to put everything up because, without filtering, without curating. Um, but there's actually a really good reason to include everything um, anyway, which is since you can't decide what people are going to be interested in, put it all up and let users decide. And give them really good tools by which they can filter on the way out rather than you trying to anticipate their interest filtering on the way in. And the really important thing this does is that it keeps the future from being too predictable. It enables an unpredictable future. So this is the last bit of what I want to say. So how do we make the place better? I want to suggest that it's by enabling more unpredictability. We have had an idea of the future. You see this all over the place in every metaphor we use just about in which the future consists of a set of paths and it's our job to choose the path that we think is best and then to narrow the possibilities down to that path. This is a nonsensical idea. It's a very powerful, deeply embedded metaphor, but the more you think about it, the less sense it makes. Um, for one thing, possibilities or paths running through a map, what's the rest of the landscape? What does that even consist of? I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to leave it there. This is, this is a very weird idea that we have deeply embedded in us, that the future consists of these type of, types of imaginary possibilities, things that you can make up and maybe you can make. If you can dream it, you can be it. Well, no, you can't. Uh, you know, and, and the evidence against that is all of human history is that you can't just dream it and be it. Uh, anyway, um, so now we have... Um, we have a new possibility, a new way of, uh, which is, for example, links. The web is based out of the idea of links in which anything can connect to anything else. Not as a dreamlike possibility, but as a real possibility. The internet and the web are based upon this sort of interoperability. Interoperability means the ability of a piece from one system to work with a piece from another system for which it was not designed. It, nobody anticipated that somebody would use this piece with those pieces from that other system. And that is the power of interoperability. It removes the filter and the constraint of having to anticipate human need and what's going to happen in human history. We can't anticipate either of those. We pay an enormous price by by insisting on only doing that which we can anticipate. We end up with a future that is way too small. So how do, how do we increase interoperability? Um, we do it by increasing access, for example. Um, open access. We do it by um, enabling, because this is not just the transfer of information, which open access enables, the sharing of information, but actually building stuff. Uh, um, we enable more interoperability by supporting standards for the interchange and reuse of information of all sorts. Um, we do it by building platforms that provide places where this stuff is made available and services by which we can actually start building stuff and mashing stuff up with other um, information across other platforms and other data sets. And we do it through a culture that embraces, encourages, and loves this sort of behavior, which is the culture of the internet that we now are seeing manifested among many of the, the people who love the internet the most. Um, th this frees up the information in what's published, not just for readers, but so that we can do many, many, many things with it, not just read it. It enables us to make the place better by making more possibilities and not just dream-like possibilities, but actual ways in which things can work together. We do this by increasing the interoperability of our technology, um, including the information pieces of it, but we allow our, our tech to work together, and we do it by making our laws favor um, interoperability, laws and customs and, and norms. And the reason why this is fundamentally a matter of morality this way of making the place better 
is that it enables us to do it without having to um, to predict. So it enables us. It embraces the idea that this is an, the world matters to us. It matters to us equally. We all deserve an equal uh, chance to flourish. But we are all going to because it matters to us differently. We're all going to flourish differently, and, but in connection. And we hope a connection of caring that helps other people to flourish as well. By removing the fetters of anticipation, we enable the world to matter to us not only equally and not only differently, but to matter to us more. We enable more mattering. We enable more possibilities that actually matter, that people care about, that enables them to be more of who they are and thus to flourish, to decide based upon their own interests and their own understanding and their own culture how they flourish. When we try to anticipate that, we limit the possibilities. And we are going from a time in which the future, we have managed the future through anticipation and preparation. We've managed it primarily by trying to narrow the possibilities to the ones that we want, either because we're selfish bastards or because we think they are best. But either way, that's too narrow. We don't need to do that anymore. We can enable more possibility, more caring, and more flourishing by making the place better, by enabling more possibility, by enabling more things to work together. That's how I think you make the place better. Thanks.